After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story. One of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is another episode of The Path Taken. Uh, this time we are going to go over Tom's record, uh, Over the Falls, which we'll get into why this is interesting. It's a great record. I mean, we wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't. It wouldn't be Tom if it wasn't. But we're going we're gonna to be talking about uh, why this record is interesting and why it is so good. It's not necessarily why it's so good. It's how it got there. So, Tom, how you doing, man? Doing pretty good. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, you know, we've been talking about doing this guy for, for a while. And it's nice to sit down and have the conversation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I don't want to talk about each song like we do quite yet. I want to talk about the, the elephant in the room that no one knows which is the fact that this is your first record where you didn't have, well, many of the instruments that are played weren't played by players that you knew. That's right. These were all, these were all loops and edited as such. So tell us, tell us what got you to this point, because if we, if anybody knows anybody your age or you or both as a musician, if you had drums on a track, you probably were in the same room with the drummer. That's right. If you had a bass player on the track, if you had an organ player on the track, whatever it is, chances are you had the player in the same room with you. So, yeah, I was playing along with them. Right. So it's like, well, what led you to this point? Well, um, the last album uh, was the uh, Calm Before the Storm, as far as a full album, and a lot of things happened between uh, 1991 and 2006 when this one came out. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, Tony and I were uh, primary caregivers for my parents, uh, and uh, also my parents' passed during that time. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of personal stuff going on. Uh, I wasn't performing at that time. If I did, it was a solo gig uh, here and there, no, nothing really big. But I was still writing. And the writing was uh, was was fun, and there there were some really nice songs that uh, that were kind of coming coming across, so to speak. And so uh, I also found at at that particular time uh, the element of loops. Now I have almost all my friends use MIDI, which is fine. I mean, they they if they're going to have something that they're going to to program out, they're going to use MIDI. But I really like the sound of loops because they were basically studio recorded. And, uh, you know, you get the feel of the actual musician in there. Now, the loops in 2006 are nothing like the loops that, that I'm using now in, in the 2020s. But uh, they, it was time for me. I, I wasn't out playing with people. I didn't have a band. Uh, it was time for me to actually think about uh, putting things together myself. And loops, to me, seemed to be the absolute best way to go about that. Uh, so I started uh, looking into researching and buying, you know, sets and CDs full of loops, uh, try to get uh, different sounds and ideas. And, and uh, that's where it all started. Um, so the transition from using live players in a professional studio to using myself as a live player and maybe one or two other live players uh, o- over the course of the entire CD and uh, using the loops became the, the prominent source of, I guess you could say, creation. Um, it also means that, in a way, I, I started to, to find out what it was like to be a composer. Because when it comes right down to it, when you're using loops, sometimes you have to cruise through hundreds to find that actual movement or that actual sound that you want. Even if it's just a small segment. And that takes a lot of time. But it's very worthwhile when you find what you want. Um, and, of course, you're, you're pretty much flying on your own. So the quality of the song really helps out, too. I mean, if you got a good song to work with, it's, it's good motivation. So, uh, so working on the loops, gathering the loops together, uh, there, there's a process to it. Uh, finding a good trap set, you know, that I could use as a fundamental part of the, uh, the rhythm section. Finding a good bass sound. All of those things became part of getting prepared to actually compose. 
because let's face it, I'm not letting a drummer go out there and do their creative thing, or I'm not letting a, an organ player do their creative thing. I'm doing it. I have to find those pieces and put them together exactly the way I want them to, to sound and feel. So it, w- it was a real departure from, from the usual studio uh, sessions that I would normally have. It was done totally at my house at Thurgood, um, and there was it was me and Steve. Uh, Steve Gallagher recorded me when I was doing my live stuff, and I basically put the loops in and created the the rhythm tracks and all the other supporting stuff like the organ parts and you know some songs had you know fiddle and mandolin and and banjo and all that stuff. I found those loops. I put all that stuff together, and it it, it the whole idea of composing it became. Uh, the emphasis and how to engineer that that composition became the emphasis as opposed to collaborating with other musicians to create a sound in the studio. Well, the next question I have for for you is, um, was there a little dirty little secret feeling that you had or no? Uh, what, what do you mean? Like a lot of musicians like yourself that are accustomed to playing with players and playing things themselves – when they start using loops, there, there, there could be a feeling of, well, am I cheating? Oh, hell no. I didn't feel like I was cheating at all. I mean, at the end of the day, it was a total creative experience. That's what it boiled down to. I could, I didn't have to depend upon, uh, you know, a drummer to throw in a particular, you know, tom-tom riff, or uh, I didn't have to worry about um, having the, the timings as far as when these people came in and what they were going to do. I mean, 99% of the time, what they did on all the previous stuff and all the stuff after this was stellar. And I didn't have any problems, you know, with with their creative and and performance abilities. But, you know, I wanted to do something on my own. Uh, It it, it was it was my home, my first, you know, I guess you could say stab at doing something at my home studio. And so knowing that and also having Steve to help me out. I really wanted to see just exactly how how well I could pull it off. There were a lot of of, of there was a learning curve there. There's no doubt about it. And uh, the, matter of fact, the first two songs were were the biggest learning curve that there, that there ever could have been. Uh, and once I got those down pat, I felt more comfortable doing the rest of them. But at the end of the day, uh, I really liked the idea of putting it together myself. Uh, I, I know it, it, we even had a podcast where you asked the question. You know, what, what would it be? Do you think you would? Uh, it would be as much fun, you know, doing it all on your own uh, as opposed to collaborating with other musicians. And I said no. Well, in, in a way, it is no because having that personal, you know, live connection with a live musician whose who's talent you really respect and enjoy is one thing. But I really needed to make this step. I really needed to make a break. I needed to to prove to myself that I could actually put out a good product with good songs, uh, you know, in my in my own home. With with the gear that I had, uh, the gear and the loops are like I said from 2006 are nothing like the ones that that are uh, that are in place now that I'm using. Uh, the audio quality and the sonic quality of the stuff that's out now and and the, and the personal studio presence of all the loops that I use are really exceptional and make it an awful lot easier and make it a lot a lot more uh, realistic and and uh, just just fun, you know, to put all the other tracks on top of. But also, I will say that in every other album after this, I was using uh, a lot more musicians than I use on Over the Falls. I mean, I used Tanya for one vocal track, and the rest was myself, uh, the, the programming that I did, and Greg Ferris, who played electric guitar and mandolin. So, uh, you know, it was, it was a stripped-down crew, but it ended up coming out with a, a really nice collection of, uh, of sounds and, and, and really good uh, performances on the tunes. Yeah, it really did. I know when I listened to it, I, it never dawned on me that it wasn't, you know, the 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 usual suspects in your life. I just it just never dawned on me. I was just like, it was it was a smokehouse for sure. But I was I was just kind of like, you know, it didn't dawn on me that until you told me. I said, no, no one played on that. You know, this person and that person and Tanya sang one song, and the rest of it was loops and me editing and putting things where I wanted to put them and looking for tones. That I that I needed to hear, and that was it. I was like, I, I my, some of there's a part of me that is still like amazed. So it, you did a great job. Well, it was it was a real departure. I mean, for me to actually, um, first of all, I wanted to do it all in the studio there, but 
and also at that particular time, considering you know we were uh, we were kind of detached from a lot of folks. I mean, I wasn't playing. I, I still had uh, my friendships and connections with people, but there wasn't a whole lot of you know let's sit down and jam you know, or have a good time playing our instruments together. There wasn't a whole lot of that going on because Tanya and I had so many other obligations with my parents and with work and all the rest of those things. So uh, so we kind of drifted away from, from the usual scene and the usual people. You know, hadn't seen Jerry in a long time, you know, hadn't seen Cam. Uh, you know, all the people that we actually used to work with on a regular basis, we just hadn't seen because they were still performing and that's where they spent their weekend time and all the rest of that. So, you know, I was pretty much on my own. And there were opportunities that were opened up to me, time opportunities that allowed me to see whether or not this loop thing was actually going to work. And uh, so I explored them and, and it did. Well, more power to you if you decide to do it again, because I promise you that was that was not one record that I listened to and go, yeah, he used loops on that. I, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> it was not. Sometimes it's a distraction. Sometimes you can tell. You know, especially when it's not, you know, when it's not electronic music or something, you know, less organic. Um, sometimes when people do it, they don't do it right. And it's distracting. It's like, man, that sounds like somebody's drum machine for sure. You know, I'm familiar with that sound. I have that sound. Really? Uh, and, it, and it's not that the songs are bad or the arrangement is bad. But sometimes if you don't do it right and you don't go the extra mile, it can really sound garden variety. I understand. And, there, there, and I still follow the same uh, kind of mantra. Uh, there, there are a lot of there's a lot of difference in the songs. Uh, you know, there there are a couple instrumentals in there. There's a bluegrass. There's a rock song. There's a there's a couple rock songs. Uh, you know, there's a lot of variety in there. And to find the loops and uh, to actually fill the bill on that, um, it took a while. As a matter of fact, that the massive amount of time I spent on this album was to find the exact loops that I wanted. Nowadays, like I said, the, the quality of the performance on the loops uh, that you buy and the, the sonic quality on them is just exceptional. I mean, I feel like I got a drummer right in the room and a bass player right in the room with me, uh, and and I can I can put that together to give the feel exactly where I want it, and, and you know, give and take whatever I want, and it's so it makes it really really great to compose that way. Um, but it was scary in the beginning, but it was also really really fun, um, a whole lot of fun. And part of it was I, I saw, okay, if I can do this, I got, I got enough songs where I could actually put another, uh, uh, certainly an EP, maybe an entire album out. Uh, if I just, you know, uh, got comfortable with the sound of the drums and the other instruments and how I could actually put them together. And it took a while, but I did. And uh, it was a lot of fun doing it. I don't mind telling you. Well, you know what? That's all that matters. I yeah, mean, but, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're right. You're right, man. You're absolutely right. <laughs> what else matters after fun, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, okay, man. I just wanted to lead in with that because I thought that, I mean, non-musical, the most interesting thing about the story of this record. I mean, like I said, for me to do it is one thing because I'm younger than you. My experience with the tools of the profession are different. Um for you, it's a story, and I appreciate you being able to change your mind because, I mean, and circumstances really don't matter because some people never change their minds. You know, I'm not trying to lessen why, but I'm just letting you know, just because you, know, just because you had circumstances, you could have been stubborn about it, but you weren't, and that, that's, that says something. Well, I mean, also, um, the one thing I always remember when, when I'm doing this is doing any project is the fact that uh, there's one person I really have to have on board no matter what, whether they're performing or not, and that's Tanya. Tanya is a, is a great critic, but also Tanya can see potential in what I'm doing. If, I, if I'm going in the wrong direction on something, then she'll be the first one to let me know. I mean, you know, she knows that, that one of the things that I, I, I hate the most is to waste time. If I was going down a road where I was wasting time, she would she would make me question where I was going to possibly op open up another avenue or option for me to go down. Um, but I knew that I really wanted to sell this to her, so uh, so I took um, she just to get get off the side, not to go too much sidebar here, but uh, at one time at, uh, during uh, the early two thousands, Tanya really got into full cams. She loved watching little baby horses being foaled and stuff like that. And there was one farm 
it was owned by a woman. I forget her name. She ended up being, you know, a jerk. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, Tanya followed her uh, and her and her full cams, uh, full, uh, full cams. Really enjoyed it. Got to know the woman. Um, uh, basically, went out to Nebraska to see this woman. Spent a week out there, you know. And so while she was gone, I spent that time putting together the first song. Uh, that was the DM Crazy song. Uh, and, and the reason why, it, it basically, it, it's it's a it's a real game changer for me because it's the only song on the entire album that I play absolutely nothing on. It's all loops, but I, I wanted to get that to, to get that feel, and I wanted to, I wanted to get it done uh, before Tanya got back, and I wasn't sure whether or not Steve could come over so I could add a part. But after I got through fin- finished with, it, I said, "Hell, I don't need to add a part. It's all there. I just need Tanya to listen to it." And so. Basically, when she came back, I played it for her. She was sold. She said, "Yeah, this this sounds good." I said, "We can do we can do an album with this, and we can do it right here in the house." And so it it, it was really great uh, to be able to have that that moment to be able to pull it all together, kind of hang your ass out over the ledge a little bit, and and see if it would work. And it did. And so that song and and another song in the album were were the ones that I actually. I guess you could say practice on, on putting together the loops. But once once I could see that I could actually do it and Tanya could actually hear that I could do it, then we were we were off and running. That's that's we'll talk about it later, but that's one that I enjoy. Uh once I understood what the DM stand for stood for, I was like, what is DM me? But when you told me, I was like, oh, and then I was like, Oh, very nice. Very nice. Well, first song, first track, uh, you know, on Over the Falls is uh, begging for a lead. First of all, where did you get your country influences from? Because when you when you do a country song, you do it. I mean, it, you you know, you're all in. So, tell, I mean, did you get that from your dad? I mean, can, you know, hanging around your dad? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, dad was that was uh, was the main influence. You know, WCMS out in the garage and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, I mean, I grew up with uh, you know. Uh, Hank Williams and Ernest Tubbs and uh, Ernest Tubb and all the rest of these other, you know, 50s and 60s country stars uh, that my dad used to sing along with and that WCMS used to play on the garage. Plus, once I started playing acoustic, you know, the acoustic rock thing, I always, the, you know, whatever group you're with, you're going to come up with a country tune somewhere that the band's going to perform. I felt really comfortable doing those things. You know, the chords are, are simple. Uh, you know, the melodies are, are rich and, and really open up all kinds of really wonderful opportunities for harmonies. And, you know, it just, it was just a great, you know, I love country music as far as the songs and, you know, about lost love and people dying and junk like that. I mean, you know, that's all part of it, but I love the musical part of it because the instrumentation, the acoustics, the the banjos, the the, the fiddles, the dobros and all the rest of those kinds of things are, are just, they're just a part of the way I hear music. Got it. Well, this is a two-part question. Number part A, did this start out as an instrumental? And part B, the tell us about the riff that started the smokehouse. I mean, that that opening riff is like smoking. It really is good. Now, it, it was going to be an instrumental. Okay, so it started that way. Oh, yeah. And uh, I wanted it to be kind of a, you know... Uh, square dancey kind of kind of kind of song uh people could t- clap along to or tap their toes to or or if you want like to jam you could jam along to it like you know there's no there's no flat picking acoustic guitar if you're an acoustic flat picker that's a great song to jam along to but the opening thing is uh was a was a loop that was a telecaster loop and i found it i found it in this electric guitar loop uh you know cd that i bought i really love the feel of it uh, they captured the the telecaster pretty well i thought and I, I knew that I could blend it into the overall recording with, without too much hassle. And so that, that particular, uh, that particular uh, loop of passage became like part of the fundamental, uh, I guess you could say, rhythm track that, w- that would help carry the song all the way through. But also, you know, uh, in the same package of loops that I got, I got, uh, uh, I got some uh, um, banjo loops. I got some mandolin loops. I got some fiddle loops. And uh, I, I was using the same trap set that I was going to use throughout the entire album. So the drums were already in place and the bass was already in place. So it's just a matter of working out that, that kind of country groove, so to speak, and then throwing all these guys in there. The neat thing about it, though, 
was that you can imagine you get a whole CD full of violin loops, fiddle loops. How do you how do you go through and pick out the ones? I, I hear a passage in my head that I want to kind of go along with what's going on, uh, or the banjo, you know, or or the you know or the mandolin or whatever. Uh, I hear these things in my head, but to find those things, and even if it, I, I would find them, and they would be like part of a loop, so I, I would chop them out and put them off to the side. I like this little passage. Then I like this little passage. I like this little passage. And it took like forever it seemed like to get all the little passages for each one of those instruments but then when i strung them all together and they actually played their their lead parts on top of the rhythm track that was there the only thing i played on that was the acoustic rhythm guitar and that would shit man that was fun i mean you know i i me and the and the and the loops for the bass and the drums uh laid down the foundation and so i took all those other instruments found the the pieces the movements that i wanted and put them all together in each one of their tracks so I could have a, a, a banjo track and a, and, a, and a, a fiddle track, and I could have a, a, a mandolin track. You know, all those things, all those guys, it's, it's really, I don't know why I named it Begging for a Lead, because all those instruments took lead parts, <laughs> you know? So it was almost like, you know, it was ironical. Ironical. <laughs> you know, that, that, I would <laughs> that, I, that I would name it that. But um, uh, that song, once I got finished with it, when I put all those those little pieces together for each one of those tracks, I knew that I could actually do whatever I wanted. I could do it with organ later on. I had had a had a CD called the Joe Vitale Organ. Man, the, if if you ever want to work with Loose, that guy gives you more stuff to work with. He is a great organ player, and you know I, I you know I was loved working with the organ with that one. So that particular one, along with uh, with the other song, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Those really gave me the confidence to know that, okay, it's going to take me forever maybe to find these parts. But once I find them, I can string them together and really have a really fun and really good sounding song. The next question would be, um, as a musician used to working with people, I mean, in a real sense, a real organic sense, and then going to loops, how much did that improve your playing, or if it didn't improve it, did you did you like playing with loops better because the timing was much tighter and much more consistent? That's that's a good question. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, uh, first of all, uh, as far as the timing and stuff like that, I'm always really been big on, on timing. Um, Sometimes you know, you, know, you know, especially if you're working with MIDI or something like that, or working with drum machines, it can sound a little mechanical. Uh, the loops uh, had a, uh, certainly were, were studio recorded, so they had a little bit more of a live, a little more real feel to them. Of course, it all depends on how you lay them into the track and everything. But you know, having that loop, the, a loop experience there, um, just allowed me to have. That one time in my life where, well, I, I would do it again in other other songs and other albums, but that one time in my life where I could actually make an album that I, that I could truly call my own um, and would show exactly where, where my musical head was at that particular moment. I also wanted to explore. I mean, uh, I had had uh, some great players, but I had never had uh, a fiddle player except for Mike Munden. You know, Mike was the only guy that ever played violin on any of my songs. And I wanted to have, I wanted to try and get a, a classical, traditional country fiddle on the song. Uh, Donnie Satterwhite played banjo on, on uh, Delta Lady, but, you know, I wanted to, 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 to work and, and, and find a, a banjo part that, that actually fit in that song. I had, I had never played mandolin, I had anybody with mandolin play with me at that particular time. So, but I loved the sound of the mandolin, and the mandolin loops that I had gotten gave me a wide variety of things to work with, both uh, single picking lead mandolin and also strumming mandolin, which both can be found in that particular cut. So it allowed me to, to have the freedom to explore those instruments. I mean, you know, if somebody really wanted to, to, to show me that, that, that it's, it's worthwhile or something, you know, uh, why don't you, you know, come in and we'll jam on that song and, and play that song the way that I actually composed it. You know, in other words, it'd be great to have, I would love to sit back with a mandolin player and have them play those mandolin parts while I'm strumming along. Same thing with a fiddle player. But, you know, the, the possibility or you know, of me actually having that all in one room, have all those players all in one room at one time, you know, 
those kinds of situations are rare and sometimes never ever present themselves. But they, but it's something that I heard in my head and something I wanted to put down on as a recording. So Loops gave me that freedom to do that. It's not that I didn't want to work with personnel. I love working with personnel. But also, you know, when you when you're working with Loops, uh, you don't have the I guess it's not a drawback. You don't have the the logistics problem of getting everybody into a studio at a particular time. Your players are already there. You know, all you have to do is put them together the way that you want in a way that's not that's not only uh, you know musically uh, sound, but is also entertaining as far as the performance is concerned. So that that allowed me to to actually create the music without having to worry about okay, uh, how long is it going to be before so and so can have the time. Because, you know, people are busy, uh, have the time to come into the studio and do it. And it was also a project that, you know, I uh, since I was so uh, removed from the performing part side of life uh, and also from, you know, I guess you could say just general communication with my, my buddies because of what life issues we were dealing with, it provided the perfect platform for me to keep creating, but also, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to do it without any... any and, you know, any problems or I guess you could say, you know, pro, not programming, but uh, scheduling issues.
Okay. Again, great track. I mean, it, that was a good one. That, that was a lot of fun. I bet it sounded like it was a lot of fun. It really did. I mean, you know, I really love finding those pieces and putting them together. High school heart. Um, my first question from a, a technical side is, I'm familiar with how your gill sounds. You enjoy how your gill sounds. But when I heard high school heart, I noticed that there's much more mid-range out of it. How did you mic your guitar, and what mic did you use? Uh, we used Stevie's um, AKG 414 uh, to, to mic the guitar. Uh, I can remember doing all the guitar parts were done. Uh, Stevie would be on uh, you know on the computer, and uh, we'd run the mic cords out into the hallway in our in our home at uh, Thorogood. I sit on a stool out there with the headphones and the and the you know the AKG in front of me, and Stevie would record the parts. Um, so that that's how that one was done. We didn't use two mics; we just used one mic. And you know that that mic is a good all-purpose mic, but it does emphasize uh, uh, the mids um, uh, uh, a little bit more than than some of the other mics would. Uh, it's also a very crisp mic, uh, so I picked up enough of the highs. I mean, my uh, my uh, Guild F50 Jumbo is is a well-rounded guitar, but it really. Um, I guess you could say really shines on the on the low mids and the bottom end side. That the high end is good, but it's not like the high end of a Martin or Taylor or something like that. But that's not really the sound that I wanted. Uh, the rhythm sound that I want was a, it, the F50 gives me exactly what I want. So at the end of the day, um, um, yeah, that that particular sound was uh, was generated by by a simple miking uh, technique out in the hallway. Got it. Now. I presume Tanya sang backing vocals on this, or was it someone else? The only person that sang backing vocals on this uh, was was Tanya, and that was only on one track, um, uh, Making Diamonds from the Coal. All the other harmonies I did myself. Wow. Nice. You always perform. Your, your, your harmonies always are really, really tight to start with, but that was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed that. I mean, uh, Tanya had kind of gotten away, you know, just like she got away, uh, you know, from the the studio thing. It had been, what, 15 years since we had been in the studio for Calm Before the Storm. Uh, she had gotten away from public performance. Um, I think that listening to this album after after we got finished with it kind of got her back in the mood because the next one, uh, By the Fence of the Sun, was probably our greatest collaborative album ever. I mean, you know, she, she was whipping on almost every single track and really, really shined out, especially on the vocals. But this, this, this one, she really wasn't, uh, really wasn't into. Uh, uh, I guess you could say the creative spirit. Uh, she was doing her own crafts and stuff. She had her own craft room, and so, and she was doing all kinds of different creative uh, endeavors on her own with several different kinds of medium. But uh, the the bottom line is, I don't think that she was really into the getting back into the studio slash performance aspect until we actually could could see that we could produce something on our own. And as time went on and the loops got better and I started re-engaging with my buddies and found new people like Greg Weichel and so forth to, you know, to come in and and share, you know, the music with me. Um, it basically, you know, that that was the only thing that she really wanted to work on at the time. And that was a song that had been around for quite we we did that song with Cam. That song, uh, Making Diamonds from the Coal, which she, she sang on, has been around for a long time, and she was very comfortable in doing that one. Now, there's a lick, there's a guitar lick that goes, that leads into each verse. What guitar tone was that? Well, first of all, what guitar was it? What amp did y'all use? Because there's a, there's a particular riff that, 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 not riff, but lick that leads into every verse on that song. Well, first of all, High School Heart was one of the songs on the album that I did all the parts myself. And... Um, there was a lot uh, going on with High School Heart. Um, you know, the finger picking and all the rest of that stuff was, was my standard finger picking style with the F50. Um, uh, but as far as any other licks that were on there, um, well, first of all, it, it, that song introduced uh, my playing the dobro. In other words, I had not played a dobro on any song ever before. I had not performed with a dobro in public before. Uh, so that song was was perfect. As a matter of fact, it's not the Dobro that I have now. I have this great, you know, uh, Beard M A MA6 uh, that, that, I, that I play now. It was a Regal. You know, it was like a beginner's Dobro. But I really worked hard on getting the recording sound for that, um, uh, getting that all squared away. It came out sounding great. But in terms of um, 
uh, that little boom, 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 that little, that little thing right there, that was a bass lick. I looked around for a transition bass lick forever, and I heard that one, and I said, that's it. It's kind of high. It's kind of odd. But that particular bass lick was, was perfect. You know, for what I wanted, it was uh, because as soon as it, as soon as it comes down, it, it slides right into um, uh, the song itself. Uh, so yeah, uh, that that basic was was a trans, really great transitional instrument. Okay, yeah, it really is cool. I mean, because it repeats itself and it's almost a melody in and of itself because it keeps repeating. It becomes a tenet of the song. Every every time it happens, you know, there's a verse coming. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to know. I didn't know if that was you. I didn't know if that was a loop or not, but I did. It was an important part of the song I wanted to ask and see. Oh, yeah. That, I, and to tell you the truth, I was really, I was really um, um, kind of stunned that I found it in the bass. I was looking for it in other places, and all of a sudden I just stumbled on it while I was going through the, uh, the bass loops, and it sounded, it was just perfect. Another good thing about loops is that, you know, generally they come in specific keys, uh, you know, but, you know, you get on your DAW, you can change the key. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I put together, like bass loops or, you know, uh, organ loops or whatever, were not in the key that the song was in, but I was able to change that, that you know, to regulate them to, to actually fit. Uh, so that particular one was one of the ones that was actually exactly what I wanted in the exact key that I wanted. I didn't have to do anything except plug it in. So that, w- that was a good one. I, I, I'm glad I found that one. <laughs>
now we can actually talk about, well, this is next on the list, um, making diamonds from coal. Now, there's this like Pat Simmons asking, if you don't know who Pat Simmons is, that is the original and still guitar player for the Doobie Brothers, and he's got a very distinct style. That lick in the beginning, was that you or was that a loop? That's a loop. Okay. That that was good. Are oh, you talking about the guitar loop? Yeah, uh-huh. No, that guitar lick is mine. Oh, okay, because I, I thought it was you, but I wasn't really sure. And it's just, that's why I wanted to ask you, because that lick is nice. Yeah, that, that particular lick... Um, uh, uh, that's the same basic lick. It's not it's not as high powered and energetic as when we played it with Cam way back in the day, but it, it's the same rhythm pattern, and uh, it's just slowed down a little bit, but it's a little bit more dynamic because when you play it fast, there's sometimes you you lose the warmth of the guitar. So I slowed it down a little bit to give it a little bit more uh, a fuller sound to make it easier for me uh, to enunciate all the lyrics and everything, and uh, it worked out great. I love playing that song. That 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 has some great rhythm moments in it. It's it's. Uh, it also helps, uh, you know, define uh, my rhythm style over the, over time. Okay, well, you know, it's an interesting song. So tell, just tell us the story. How did how did you get inspired by this? I forget who I was with. I know Tanya was there, but we were walking on um, uh, Chesapeake Beach, uh, got as far down as the Lesnar Bridge. And at that particular time, it was during the summer. At that particular time, you couldn't go swimming in the bay, uh, mainly because you could look off in the distance and you can see all these coal colliers these huge gigantic coal tankers, so to speak, they were waiting, you know, because it was a railroad strike at the time and they, they couldn't load these, uh, these ships with coal to take it to other countries. So they were sitting out there and while they're sitting out there, what do they do with their garbage? What do they do with their sewage? Well, they dumped it right in the bay. And because of that, the bacteria counts went up and all the rest of that kind of stuff, it was horrible and you couldn't swim. At the same time, uh, there were uh, other environmental events going on. There was, I don't know if, uh, if you remember, but that back in the day, there was a, uh, a keypone contamination. There was this barge loaded with keypone, which is a toxic chemical uh, that overturned in the James River. And all the keypone, uh, basically, it didn't dissolve in the water. It went straight to the bottom because it was a heavy you know, chemical. It went straight to the bottom and just ate up all the oyster beds. So the oystermen, you know, first of all, the oysters that were down there, they couldn't sell because they were contaminated. So basically, you know, it took a long while for that to clear up. So, you know, uh, the fishermen who and the oystermen, you know, had a terrible time but, uh, because of that contamination. And I just thought to myself, you know, all this this keypon, this coal stuff, it's just a bunch of people trying to make money. And they don't give a damn about what's happening to to the local environment and so forth. So I figured, okay, it's time for me to write a song that actually, you know, makes a statement about pollution and its impact. And the only reason why it's there is because uh, people are making diamonds or making money uh, from doing these activities. Got it. Yeah, because when I listen to it, I can tell, I can, I can feel everything that you just said. You're not happy about it. It's ridiculous. What are you doing? Yeah, and, and you know, I've lived around here my entire life. One thing about... Uh, about this area that I've always loved is that people key to the water, whether they're living on waterfront or whether they visit the beach or they visit the bay. It's an important part of life. Even if it's just sitting back and watching the sunrise or sunset or, or watching the activity on the water. I mean, the water is a big part of it. And to know that you're sitting there and that the water is just like contaminated so much that if like, if I went swimming in it, I could get sick. That, that, that just to totally sucks. And so uh, yeah, that I, I tried to to sell the song to the Save Debate Foundation, but they wouldn't have anything. <laughs> so I mean, but at the end of the day, it was my statement at that particular time about uh, about pollution, and uh, I thought you know I thought it got across the message pretty good. Now with this track and with all of them, actually, it's kind of a general question. What was your mixing experience? Was it easier? Or was it harder? Or well, I mean, the hardest thing for me to do was was to get. Uh, the sonic quality of, of the the rhythm tracks uh, done. Uh, I, I was I was a novice when it came to that. I mean, I could program them, you know, to where they could have little little you know smidges of like you could stretch them or or move them around to where they had a little bit more of a real feel, which is good. But the tones uh, are, are are nowhere near as good as I've got them now. It was it was a brand new engineering thing for me to learn, and and you could tell from listening to the Over the Falls album. And then listening to Renaissance Man. I mean, you listen to something like, uh, you know, Making Diamonds from the Cold, then listen to 10 and 14. There is a difference beyond, you know, 
uh, it's just a, a gigantic leap from the quality of the engineering and the quality of the loops and stuff. So it was a learning experience. It was a learning curve for me. But I, I knew uh, that the whole thing was was the whole thing was all uh, just like any other album. It was about generating a sound. And those particular loops, you know, the the fundamental rhythm loops and the and the other stuff that I would put on top of it, including the stuff from Greg, uh, would would you know would establish a sound. And if I made you know if I had like one too many uh, tom tom fills in there, or you know if I had one too many, um, or not enough uh, cymbal crashes, or the hi hat, you know, and so forth, as far as the quality of the tone of those things, uh, all of that was was part of the learning experience. I think I, I created a sound, which is what I wanted to do, um, and I think I over, over the years following that that I chose I chose much more sophisticated loops, and of course the loop quality of what they were selling just got you know exponentially better. So that made my job easier, and of course you know I yielded a, a lot better recordings in terms of just the sonic quality of the of the actual tracks. That came to stay Their lights shone bright like diamonds That were cast upon the day I reflected for a moment And remembered why they came And I realized my hometown Would never be the same For a never-ending water Casts its waste upon the shore We will work to cleanse their memory for a thousand years or more It's the rumble in the distance It's the calm before the storm We've been blinded, we've been beaten We've been taken, we've been worn Some men look to drill in oil And some men dig for gold While others build their coffers Making diamonds from the coal Distance is the calm before the storm. We've been blinded, we've been beaten, we've 
attention taken been won Some men look to drill in oil and some men dig for gold While others fill their coffers making diamonds Crazies. Now that we know DM stands for Dave Matthews, Crazies, and they are a very rabid fan base, that's for sure. Um, what led to this? Were you just listening to Loops and heard it and it was like, wow, that's kind of cool. That reminds me of, or did you, how did you, how'd you get there? Well, the first, the first one, uh, the first loop that I, that I ran across that just really tripped my trigger was the acoustic guitar rhythm loop. Uh, you know, there were, there are two or three different rhythm loops in there. Uh, uh, with, of course, uh, some uh, some transitional loops to take it from one uh, measure to another. But I really like the, the rhythm guitar, uh, the rhythm acoustic guitar. Um, uh, I also like uh, uh, like the, the electric guitar stuff that was in there. Um, uh, I, I like that the sound of the bass was really kind of odd. It, it was almost like an a electro-pop kind of sounding bass, but uh, it, was, it gave the kind of feel that I wanted. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, it starts off simple, it ends simple, and it builds, you know, instrument by instrument going all the way through. I love the way it transitions from, from, uh, from I guess you could say, instrumental verse to the next instrumental verse, uh, the use of the instruments and the non-use of the instruments uh, to make those transitions. Um, that was the song that I created when Tanya went to Nebraska. And so, so that, was, that was, without a doubt, the first most existential learning experience that I had with trying to compose something with loops. And like I said, that, that particular song is the only song on the entire album that uh, the only thing on there is loops. And if I could sell Tanya on that, you know, that the sound and the feel of that. And uh, she, she said, she, she actually kind of gave me a comment. She said, well, well who's playing, who's playing uh, the electric guitar on this? I said, nobody. I said, whoever created the loop is playing the electric guitar. And she was just, she had this, this big shit eating grin on her face. She said, that sounded really cool. Uh, I want to hear more. So yeah, that, that was a, a, a real, you know, that was a, a benchmark moment for me because when I got the, I got a positive criticism from Tanya about uh, on that without her even knowing, especially after she got back and said, this is what I did while you were gone. You know, uh, the fact that I was, I put my time to good use and, uh, came up with something good. Uh, uh, she she saw the sense in it. So yeah, it was it was a great song to put together. Well, that was a good take. Um, I thought all kinds of things. I had all sorts of questions, <laughs> and you, and you ruined it for me. I'm sorry, like, man. It's all good, man. It's, it's it kind of really really cool. It's kind of podcast gold because I promise you, I had like three more questions that had to do with 
you know, you playing. And it's just like, you're like, man, there ain't nobody playing on that but loops. And I was like, <laughs> what are you doing, man? What are you killing me over here? I'm dying up here. You're killing me. But I mean, it's a really interesting story. It's like I said before, for you to do it, someone like you to do it, transitioning from one lifestyle to the other, like I said, as far as the tools that are used to make music, it really is a departure, and I appreciate you for doing it. You did a win. You did a great job because it wasn't distracting. I couldn't tell. Well, I mean, you know, it also um, when it was finally compl- completed, and uh, I was able to produce CDs at home. You know, made the labels and all the rest of that kind of stuff, packaged them, and all the rest of that. Uh, it actually uh, was. It wasn't the commercial success of all the other albums. But it was a commercial success in the fact that people liked it, and I was able to to actually sell you know a pretty substantial number of them uh, to friends and family and people who had heard it online, and uh, so that just you know that said okay I'm going in the right direction you know uh, and uh, uh, so you know take ten years uh, for the next one to come out, but at the end of the day uh, it really gave me the confidence to know that th- that the loop thing is something that I could actually uh, use. Uh, when and if I needed it, and uh, and I've used it for my rhythm tracks, except for the times I've worked with Ken McNeil, I've used it with my, for my rhythm tracks every every single thing I've done since, and it really has paid off. Now the percussion stuff I use, uh, you know, I could use somebody like Pete or Lloyd, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, that uh, it really set in stone the fact that I was on the right path. <laughs>
So the next song is Over the Falls. Now, from the title to the cover of the record, I had an idea of what the song was going to be. I didn't kind of, I didn't know, but I had a feeling it would be something other than it was. So my first question to you is, what is the story? Well, I mean, you know, there are, there are certain things in life that, um, uh, that, that, you, that just all of a sudden you just, just hit you. Uh, I love the line in there, uh, uh, politicians lying, everybody's dying, no one wants to, uh, uh, no one uh, finds good help anymore. I mean, that is true. That was true in 2006. That is true now. That will be true forever. I mean, you know, those are just little things that are just the way that things are. Politicians will always be lying to us. You know, people will always be dying, and you will. You ask anybody that's in business, they will tell you it's the hardest thing about their their business is finding good people to work for them. You know, so those were certain truths, uh, uh, like the opening line: thirty years of work and too many keys, too many visions that nobody sees. I mean, uh, you know, there there are certain restraints, both political and financial, and, and education, where you can come up with this absolute great idea. You can have all your all your the right people in your department on board. And when you go to, to, to get some approval or to get some resources or to get some funding for it, they shoot you down in flames because they just can't see it. Everybody who, who's on board could see it, but they couldn't see it. Uh, so, you know, it was like, okay, uh, the, 2004 is when I retired from Chesapeake. So that song, that particular verse was perfect to go along with my retirement. It wasn't like the, uh, the administration and stuff like that. Uh, really worked against us. It's just the way of the world in education in a lot of situations. I mean, you know, uh, it comes down to the state, to the, you know, to the division, to the division, to the school, to the school, to the department. I mean, you know, at, by the time it gets to you, there ain't a whole heck of a lot left. And sometimes getting what you need to do the right job is just impossible. So that was part of the, That was, you know, you take all those frustrations, you put them in a barrel and send them over to false because, you know, I'm done with it. You know, every single thing in that song, uh, you know, about the, the cheating woman, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, that's a part. That's, that's almost like a country. It could have been a good country lyric, but it wasn't a country song. <laughs> but, you know, those kinds of things. Um, uh, so, I mean, you know, that's that that song was just like, uh, you know, some things you just got to you just got to toss them away. You just got to toss them to the side. All those people that say they're going to do this. You know, all the politicians, stick them in a barrel and throw them over the falls, too. I mean, you know, it, sometimes it just it's, gets frustrating. And, uh, um, you know, the thing that really, I love the lyrics in that song, but the thing that, that to me that really sells it is Greg's lead and the organ part. I mean, Greg, Greg Ferris is the only other person on the album. He did great stuff on Making Diamonds from the Coal. And, you know, the, he, but he really shined on this one. Uh, his lead in this, uh, both his rhythm chops and his actual lead were were great, um, and that's another story too about how how Greg because I never spent a day in the studio with Greg, not one day, not one second. Well, I mean, this is the podcast for it. Tell us the story. I mean, I mean, I mean, dig deep. Tell us the story. <laughs> well, um, Greg oh, yeah, Ferris. I don't, mean to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but also that leads into the next question, just like it, because I want you to share with us the editing of the organ. Okay. Okay. I could do that. So that's, like, that's, that's a big part of that song. Absolutely. Um, Greg Ferris played, uh, was a lead guitar player on um, uh, the Songsmith album, on a couple of the cuts on the Songsmith album. And um, uh, so, and I knew Greg from, from high school and, uh, but you know, Greg moved to Lynchburg, uh, you know, and so you just, you just lose track of people. It's not like, you know, you could connect easily on social media back then. It just wasn't around. So, um, I, when I was working for uh, Wesleyan, uh, we had a, an education conference at Sweetbriar, which is right outside of Lynchburg. So I went up to Sweetbriar College. I knew that Greg was in Lynchburg, and I looked him up in the, looked up in the phone book, and there he was. I called him up and told him I was in town. He said, come on out, man. He gave me directions. He way out in the country. You know, I had to go out there after all the meetings were over, which is the nighttime. It took me forever to get there, but it was great to see him. We sat, you know, we drank some wine and, and sat down on his porch. And had this great discussion. He showed me his studio. He was using uh, Cubase uh, as his uh, uh, his DAW and was working on his own stuff. And so, you know, I I, I said, you know, I, I'm starting to, to get into this loop thing, and 
and I also wanted to try something with him. I knew he'd be a great electric guitar player and a great mandolin player for the songs that I had in mind, but he couldn't come to the studio and I couldn't bring it up there. So what I had him do was I sent him for all the tracks that he played on, which were, let's see, he played on Making Diamonds from the Coal, uh, Over the Falls, Way of the World. I think that's it. But on those tracks, I sent him the basic rhythm and, and um, um, you know, scratch vocal track. I sent them to him on a CD because we really didn't have the, let's swap the MP3 thing going on back in 2005. So I sent all those tracks on him to him on, on a CD. I said, look, Rick, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this, the, each one of these tracks and strip them off the CD, put them into an individual song on your DAW, hand them all the way to the right. Then I want you to add tracks, lead tracks or mandolin tracks, depending on what the song happened to be. Add tracks to it, okay? And each track will, you know, will be panned completely to the left. So basically, there will be no crossover. I would not hear anything of the stuff that I sent him, the basic, you know, fundamental rhythms. I would not hear them. Once you get those tracks done, burn them on a CD and send the CD back to me. So since they were done in real time, you know, Greg uh, sent the CD back to me. I stripped all those things, put them in to the, my DAW and pick and chose, you know, it gets, you know, cherry picked exactly what I wanted to have for each song and each part. So Greg gave me about four or five different lead tracks for every single song that, and also the mandolin songs and stuff like that. He gave me it's a lot of stuff to work with. And so I was able to, to use his, his parts and, uh, and never ever spend a moment in the studio with Greg, but, it proved to me, and I've used this time and time again, especially with David Edwards, it proved to me that I could actually have a great recording situation. Of course, it's a lot easier now with the new technology and, and sharing stuff. But back in 2005, that stuff wasn't around. But I knew that it could work if we just followed, you know, you know, give him, you know, the original tracks, give him the, the beats per minute, the key, and we're off and running, you know. So that worked. And so Greg was able to add wonderful parts to this album uh, without even being in the studio with me a single minute. Wow. So now tell us how you edited the organ. Well, going back to the Joe Vitale thing, when you get the Joe Vitale organ CD of organ loops, he gives you a whole bunch of different stuff, different sounding organs. It gives you entire ensemble parts, you know, that are whole movements and stuff like that. But he also gives you, uh, you know, you have blues, you have, uh, you know, uh, funk, you have, you know, rock and roll. He gives you these different, you know, passages that you can work with. And uh, there were certain things that I wanted to have for rhythm. And they're, you know, they're just bah, da, 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 that kind of thing. There was just to have us like a drone sound in the back, you know, rhythmic, but, you know, but not overwhelming. So that the lead parts and the vocals and stuff could cut through. But then when the organ actually... Uh, uh, took a lead, uh, there was enough lead, there were enough lead parts and lead passages to where I could sit through that particular, like uh, the organ lead uh, before the second verse. Uh, that actually was about, I don't know, 10 or 12 different organ pieces that were all put together, put in the same key or, or put in the, in the key that, that happened to be the chord at the time and actually strung together to make that organ, that organ lead. And you know, if I didn't, those, those organ parts, the, or, the tone of his organ stuff is great. So I didn't have to work all that hard to, to make them fit in and uh, to especially to, to, uh, to be a nice, uh, I guess you could say, accompaniment with Greg's guitar stuff. So that, that really uh, was a lot of fun putting that organ together. And I, I felt so good and so successful with it. I've used that in other things as well, uh, especially on the Renaissance Man album, um, even Over the Falls. I mean, not Over the Falls, but uh, By the Fence of the Sun. You know, I have some organ parts on there. So at the end of the day, you know, that gave me the confidence to, I feel like, you know, if I actually would have had the time, I probably could have been a pretty good organ player, but I just never, you know, never went down that road, that keyboard road.
visions that nobody sees. I see the writing, and it's all over the wall. I'm gonna put it in a barrel and send it over the phone. I caught her lying, I caught her cheek, I caught her begging for it down on her knees. I'm shaking something, but the man is too tall. I think I'll put her in a barrel and send her over the phone. Definitely a bullseye for you because it's so folk. So tell us the story. What was the inspiration? Well, um, I had the finger picking part first. Um, I really enjoyed the, the, the feel of that finger, finger picking part. I mean, um, it has in a way with, with the bass notes and stuff like that, it has its own, uh, almost like its own little melody going on. But, you know, it, it, otherwise, it, it's not a standalone finger picking part. Nothing like Missing My Old Man or something like that. It wasn't something like that. It, it needed some accompaniment. Uh, I found in the uh, uh, part of the percussion loop things, I found a, a, re, a repetitive uh, um, uh, kunga kind of thing uh, with, the, you know, with a couple of things with, the, you, know, uh, you know, some uh, other different uh, percussion instruments and created, along with the finger picking, I created a little rhythm to go along with it. There's no bass in there at all. Just, just the, you know, the ensemble percussion, so to speak, and my finger picking. Well, uh, that's the one I said, Greg. <laughs> it, you know, the thing, what the thing I sent him was over seven minutes long, 
And it, it's not pieced together. I mean, you know, I played the rhythm part, uh, the finger picking part for seven minutes, you know, along to the, to the, um, uh, to the ensemble percussion thing. And so I said, Greg, you know, you need to put, uh, you know, put some mandolin on there because he was really into his mandolin at the time. He started, I mean, I got two tracks from him, but those are two nonstop. I'm starting at the beginning and playing all the way to the end mandolin parts. So he actually put like over 12, 14 minutes worth of, un, you know, unedited mandolin. I'm, I'm rocking with your, with your finger picking thing, Tom. And it was wonderful. There, there are some mandolin moments in there that are just stunning. I mean, he, he, Greg really is, is a great player. And, and mandolin, he was into his mandolin at the time, and it really showed because he, he really came across with some really good moves on that. But it also allowed me uh, the chance uh, to, to do something that I had never done before. Um, I did it only twice, once on this song and once on 17 times, to actually play a dobro lead. I mean, you know, I'm not known as a dobro player. Uh, up to this point, you know, no one had ever even seen or heard me play the dobro before unless they had come over to the house. And, um, but I had gotten pretty good on my dobro and Tanya, you know, said, you need to, you need to start, maybe think about putting some dobro on it. So I thought about it and, um, uh, Stevie came over one day, I got out in the hallway with his, his, you know, AKG 414 to my, and my dobro, my regal dobro, uh, and, and put that track on there. And it worked because the sound of his mandolin and the sound of the dobro, it's not really a bluegrass song. But it's got those bluegrass instruments in it, acoustic guitar, mandolin, and dobro. So you can't get much better than that in terms of creating a sound. The rhythm, the rhythm track I tried to keep constant, in, but in the background. A lot like when you do your podcast with your friends, you have that, that music thing going on and the underlying is there. And it helps, helps the, 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 the flow of things, but doesn't overwhelm or doesn't, you know, I guess you could say, uh, dominate in any way that would be distracting. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, uh, that whole creation of all of that was, was pretty much, uh, okay, I'm going to jam for seven minutes on this thing a couple of times and I'll give it back to you. He did that, you know, on the same time he did his electric guitar stuff and sent it all back to me at the same time. So he gave me a wealth of stuff to work with. And some of the parts that he has, uh, when I heard them, I, it, they were just, you know, <sighs> They were great. I mean, you know, how a person can actually sustain that much of a, of a mandolin lead and has so much good stuff in it for such a long time, um, you know, it was a real tribute to his playing ability. Greg's a great player. Now, again, I ask you, did this start out as an instrumental? Yes, it did. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, to me, uh, it, it was, I, I, I didn't have anything lyrically to go with it to begin with. And the more I got into the whole idea of the finger picking and then, you know, uh, coming up, uh, actually coming up with the ensemble percussion parts that were in there um, and also started playing along with my dobro and then sent it off to Greg. And once it all kind of got back in there, it was it was the perfect blend. It's exactly uh, exactly the way that I wanted it. I didn't want to have any other, you know, instruments in there, no acoustic guitars. Uh, it didn't need it, you know, because there was there, there was enough right there. I've always imagined, you know, what it might be like to actually have like uh, uh, Pete Schoener, you know, picking up the percussion stuff and having somebody playing dobro, me playing the acoustic guitar, and uh, maybe have Greg Weichel on mandolin or something uh, to do that live. Uh, how much fun that would be! It's never been done live, but it's a it's a song that's that's made for being done live. You know, it's it's a good tune for that.
Well, this is the last song, um, indicative of everything I've experienced with you uh, in your recorded history. You all, there's always one song that's like, really, man, really. <laughs> and this song is called Seventeen Times. Well, yeah. I mean, you you hit it out of the park because your country influence is obvious, and yeah, so I'm definitely. like, okay, this is going to be good. Didn't really expect you to be a creeper, but you kind of are. <laughs> I'm like, dude, don't be calling the women 17 times, man. Don't be out here in these streets calling women 17 times. Please don't go to jail. And you always make me laugh and you always surprise me. And this was the track that did it on this record. So, man, tell me the story. Well, to tell you the truth, it's um, I got the inspiration for that song uh, on my I was smoke. I used to smoke back in the day. And I, w- when I was teaching at Wesleyan, uh, I had night courses, and they would be like uh, an hour and a half long. And so I would give my students a 15 or 20-minute break, you know, to go outside and, you know, smoke if they wanted to, just, you know, check out the outdoors, or take a walk or whatever, and come back, and we'd finish class. But, you know, I would sit out there smoking my cigarettes, and they wouldn't be the only students out there. There'd be students coming in and out of the student union and things like that, and they'd be talking, Okay. I'd hear their conversations, and almost every single one of them would have a cell phone in their hands. Remember, this is 2005. Smartphones really hadn't kicked in yet. Everybody had a cell phone. And the main things that you had on your cell phone were your ringtones, okay, and your pictures. That's pretty much it. And calling somebody. So that that, that, that was the good. Uh, you could text, but, you know, uh, text was in its infancy, you know, back then. So uh, I would watch them. You know, and they would they would be talking about, uh, uh, about this, that, and the other about their their personal experiences, but everything was centered around the phone. You know that you know the whole idea of they would talk about I got this ringtone or take a look at this picture, you know, or or music, but the music quality wasn't all that great on a cell phone. You know, it didn't have the the speaker quality, and they didn't have the speakers, uh, the the earbuds and stuff that they have now. So the music was was part of it, but you know. Cell phone was is not a smartphone, okay, uh, camera wise or otherwise. So I, I basically, uh, you know, I I started looking at all of a sudden the the, the idea about um, um, your students getting out of bed. You know, the last song that they heard is the one that they have when they wake up in the morning, um, and so when they call their friends, uh, they'll call them. You know, at, until somebody picks up or. Or or leaves you know gets back to them on a voicemail, but the whole idea is is uh, you know pick up your phone, uh, I, I you know I, it's not just you know bells and whistles. I want to hear your voice. I want to have a conversation. A lot more at least back then than it is now. Now uh, you know having a conversation is all in text or all in blog or all in something else. But you know 2005 was a different time, and so uh, that it just seemed to fit. And so something like a little, uh, you know, like a little country kind of harmony, little country three-part harmony thing going on, um, plus a dobro lead. I really enjoyed doing that lead on the dobro. Uh, uh, that, w- that was fun. But also doing the harmonies. Uh, uh, that was a lot of fun, too. The hardest thing to do on that song was the bass. Not that the playing the notes were, were, was hard, but I had to do that, you know, from a keyboard using that particular, you know, sound. Um, and uh, I did it through the, I, matter of fact, I used the Insonic for that because I wanted, I didn't want to, I wanted to actually play it myself. So that was the last thing I ever did using my Insonic EPS was to put that bass on there. And I was afraid I wouldn't be able to engineer the, the bottom line, the bottom end of it, because it has some really low notes on there. But I didn't think I was going to engineer, could engineer the bottom uh, those really low notes uh, as well as I did. But I did. I pulled that off. That was that was an engineering, you know, problem that I had to solve. And and I, I you know I thought I did a pretty good job solving it. But that was that was a that was a fun song to do. And that was also a song that I could perform. You know uh, that, that you know it, it's got a fun lyric and you know it's a uh, it's it's a period piece now. I mean when you think about it. I mean, how many people do you know that actually had that haul around a cell phone anymore? The one guy I know, and it's so random. So, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's like, okay, the consumer cellular crowd, even they're going to smartphones. You know what I mean? Uh, so, so, so having a cell phone, you know, it kind of takes you back. I can remember the first cell phone I had, 
You know, I can remember the stuff that I did on there, the little teeny tiny screen and hard as, you know, unless you had a BlackBerry, it was really hard to, to text out anything because, you know, you didn't have a keyboard, you know, you couldn't, couldn't talk. It didn't have voice recognition to where you could actually say your message and all that. It, it was just like ancient now, but, uh, but, you know, but people were into it and that was part of the way that they communicated and the, and the bells and whistles that a, that a, a cell phone uh, provided was really part of what young people were into as far as communicating with each other. I get out of bed with a thought in my head that'll carry me all through the day. Sometimes it's good like every day should And sometimes it's too bad to say When I feel alone I take my cell phone And push me a number or two I don't really care I just hate dead air Please answer on one ring or two I'm calling you 17 times Just to hear your voice on the line Please answer when you hear the chime I'm calling you 17 times Well, sir, that is it. Uh, we have gone through Over the Falls, and it was fun as always. Um, but I do have one more question for you. Okay. So with the intention of everything that you, you know, as far as you, you using the loops, 
and everything that you did to build around it or just like orchestrating the loops, you know, exclusively, everything that you had in your mind that you wanted to accomplish with this particular offering, did you succeed? I think so. I do. Um, I like, I, as a matter of fact, I went back when I knew that we were going to be uh, doing this podcast, I went back and listened to the songs again. And uh, what's really weird is that, you know, because it was like almost a, a total solo effort, except for, for Greg and Tanya, um, there was a lot more engineering that went into this album than any other album, even though it doesn't have as many songs as like By the Fence in the Sun or something, a lot more engineering because it was all new. It, it was all fresh and it was all different. And you know, uh, I didn't study composing. It was just a matter of putting things together the way I felt like, like they should go together. I knew how to engineer stuff from the previous, you know, professional studios and working with Steve at home studios. But I mean, it, it was just so different. Uh, but I, I, I listened to it and I said, you know, if you got good songs to work with, then you got you got more than half the battle won. Uh, it's just a matter of getting that right feel and making sure that your vocals are, are, are spot on. And um, and then just running with it. Uh, Greg was a great collaborator as far as the music is concerned. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen Greg, but um, he he's he is a great collaborator. Uh, and we we worked well, like I said, at a distance. And I saw him one more time. We had another conference the next year up at Sweetbriar, and I got a chance to see him again. But that was the last time that I saw him, and uh, 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 had to maybe re you know, reestablish contact with the man. But he has, you know, he's, he does has a couple of solo acoustic albums out. They're very, very good. If you love acoustic guitar playing, uh, acoustic uh, guitar aficionados, he's the guy. He's a really good guy. Very eclectic in some ways, but also very smooth and traditional in others. But, yeah, I really believe that that uh, that, uh, that particular uh, experience set in stone uh, some real basic engineering and performing aspects. By the time we got to the next album, By the Fence of the Sun, which was 10 years later, um, I had reestablished contact with a lot of really great people, uh, you know, established contract, uh, contact with Greg Weichel and Joanna Benford and Richard Spano, people, you know, as well as, you know, Stevie and Donnie and all the rest of the folks that, that I'd been with. So basically that, that album had uh, mostly just uh, the rhythm tracks uh, were the only thing. All the other instruments would be played by people. But I knew that if I wanted something, uh, that the loops were there and I could have that. But you know, it was it was nice to uh, to to find a really really nice blend, to to actually to actually send tracks off to these musicians who are who are used to being in the studio with live musicians on stage with live musicians, and to, for them to say, hmm, this sounds like it could be fun. We could really make something out of this. I'm going to spend time with Tom making this thing happen. That was a real big boost too. The fact that you know they didn't they didn't come out and actually say, man, I love the way that rhythm track comes, but they loved it. They loved the hell out of playing on them and had a good time doing it. We all had a good time in the studio with every single thing that would be loop-oriented, which would provide the foundation for, you know, a lot of the tracks that would come in the future. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, I had good songs to work with on the Over the Falls album. You know, Ty had Tanya's support, and I had Greg there, you know, to fill in the gaps where I really needed them. So engineering-wise, performance-wise, and writing-wise, I, I think it was a real success, uh, at least to me. It, it, as far as uh, a learning process, and also, um, I was surprised how many of them I sold, to tell you the truth. There was still a fan base out there that was willing, you know, to, hey, I'll chime in. Come on, send me, you know, you got them for sale, I I'll buy one from you. Uh, so, you know, uh, plus since I did it all on my own, it also gave Stevie and I another chance to explore engineering together that, um, you know, that uh, was something new, uh, adapting to you know, playing out in the hallway of my house at Thurgood wasn't like playing in a normal studio, but it worked and we made it work and we got good sounds out of it. And so, you know, that was, that was another continuing plus. It was, it was just positive all the way around, even though it took a while to actually get out, put it out there. Well, sir, I appreciate your time as always. Um, thank you for your offering. Thank you for your talent. Well, thank you, man. I, I, you know, it, it I would not be able to share this if it wasn't for you and, and our mutual enjoyment of, of the exploration of music, especially the original stuff. Um, uh, it means all, it means the world makes all the difference in the world to me. I'm so glad because it means a lot to me and all, all the rest of us that are fans of yours. Well, folks, this has been another episode of the path taken for Tom. This is Alton and we will see you the next time.
This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. On behalf of Tom, this is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken.